I'm not the type of person to be, you know, uh, a clout chaser or hot of the moment. I needed to do something in my community, be a, a, a thorn on the sides of, of the politicians who sit there and ain't doing shit. Kevin, thank you so much for joining the podcast. I'm, ex- I'm super excited to have you on. Uh, you thank and I you. have not met in person before, so this will be a lot of fun just kind of digging into your your backstory. I have done a decent amount of, of uh, research, although there's not a lot about you online. I don't know if that's on purpose or, or <laughs> what that's about. You got a few um, clips, obviously, and you know the highlight reel is online, but I couldn't find a whole lot about your your the depths of your backstory. So hopefully we can get into uh-huh. some of that in this conversation. Understood. Understood. Yes, I am I'm self online. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up in um, in Jamaica, Queens? Born and raised. Okay. So just talk a little bit about your 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 household that you were born into. I know um, you've you've mentioned your dad before, Henry Clayton, in in, in, uh-huh. uh, in an inter- in an interview. But were your parents together? Did you have siblings? Like, what was the vibe like in your household growing up? Um, no, my parents weren't together. But you know, my my dad, my hero dad, uh, was always there. Um, you know, com- accompanied by my hero mother. Um, many people don't even think I have a mother because I, <laughs> I always talk so much about my father, but, you know, I lost my father, you know, suddenly. Um, you know, so I grew up in South Jamaica. I had a great family household. You know, my dad would always be by there. It was me and my brother and my sister lived in Maryland. Um, so, you know, but that's, you know, who's my best friend. Um, so, you know, typical, you know, we didn't have much, you know, my mom worked, my dad was an entrepreneur. He's always been an entrepreneur. He started with a, a image terminated business. And, uh, my mother's always been, um, in the community. She used to always host like Halloween parties for kids in the community and always actively involved in PTAs and things of that nature. So what I do now, the business and the community aspect is really a testament to both of them. My mother was always community. My father was always business. Did your parents have any philosophies when you were growing up? My dad was an entrepreneur too. And he always used to say, you need to own your own business. You know, obviously you got to work hard. You got to work twice as hard because uh-huh. you're black and blah, blah, blah. Did your, well, uh-huh. What do you remember most from your childhood growing up? I mean, my father used to always make me come into the travel agency when I was 15. I never forget it, you know, when he started his, his travel agency because he had a... Mm-hmm. And um, at one point, he was the largest Black-owned travel agency in, in the city in regards to the sales. Um, but um, he would have me get dressed up in a suit and all this other stuff to go in the back of the travel agency and stamp brochures. You know, it's always pissed me off. Um, oh, yeah. And I would make $25 on Saturdays to do that, you know. Um, but he taught me how, you know, you have to look the part. And but still get back there and, and stamp Dusty has brochures. Um, mm-hmm. But um, he taught me a lot. You know, I just see my father, like a lot of things my father do, I do now. You know, I can't go nowhere without my to do list. You know, and I used to always wonder why he always had to scrabble uh, to do list, you know, and, 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 and having to entertain people's personalities every five minutes. People always call him. Like I literally am like a splitting um, representation of my father in regards to that aspect with the busyness. And what kind of student were you? Were you uh, horrible? Were you straight A? <laughs> Absolutely horrible. I was kicked out of high school in ninth grade. Really? Absolutely horrible. Um, and and what, I still have my report for? cards. Um, I never went to class and I was a class clown. You know, I, I was the type of person to be in the classroom and throwing spitballs at the teacher or at the at the dartboard, at the blackboard in the um, classroom. Me and my buddy Tamane, who we're still friends with to this day. Um, you know, we were, we were just absolutely horrible. (laughs) Um, I, I, I remember, um, in, um, in, in middle school, I, uh, was suspended the last day of school. I, uh, cursed out the assistant principal at the last day. I got suspended the last day. I was really bad at school. So you were a knucklehead. Yeah. I was on everybody's do not promote promotion and doubtless. I was on every single one of them. We always see Kevin Lewis's name minted to the top. Huh. I'm so, so serious so, when I say that. So none of your teachers really thought much of you and where you no. were going in your life. They probably assumed no. you'd be in jail or something at some no. point. 
Yeah, no, I because I, I wasn't like a tough guy. I was just a clown. You know, okay. so I don't even think they would think that I was in jail, but you know, I didn't think, you know, because I was I was a typical statistic. You know, I, I had two kids before the age of 20. You know, when I left school, um, you know, I had my I was six, I was 17 when I got kicked out of school. You know, um, so you know, I went to a GED school and that didn't work out. <laughs> um, and then I went and worked for a little bit and then I went back and got my GED. Did that create a rift between you and your parents when you got kicked out? No, no. My mother was always on my neck, but I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was a waiter in a restaurant, but um, my mother was always on my neck. And my father, you know, he's the type of person like you're a man, you know, on your ass, you know, and uh, do what you got to do. But he know that I didn't get kicked out because I was not smart. You know, I I had uh, ADHD. Like I, you know, to this day, you know, if I sit down for more than five minutes, I'm ready to like start swinging from the chandeliers, mm. <laughs> you know. Um, I always got to be actively involved. So these are things that, um, that, you know, I actually, uh, you know, happened with me in my younger, my younger years. But that was undiagnosed, obviously. You didn't know, nobody knew about ADHD back then. No, not really. But I was a clown. Like, I just like to have fun. You know, I would never go to class, and, you know, typical high school thing. But the thing is, is that when it was one class in school, in high school that I went to, that I got a uh, a minus and that was mm. business business it was a business course i forgot which one it was but oh introduction to business one of those two and um i i i aced that class and then i went and i was a part of a, um a club it was called future business leaders of america bad as i was mm -hmm. in school i still got my transcript from high school like all 46 is average but I, I, I rejoined this club and I wound up becoming the president, the, the vice president of that club. Um, hmm. And um, I went and I competed um, in, a, in a tournament. They had a tournament in Rochester, New York for, um, you had an impromptu speaking um, tournament where they give you a topic and you had to speak on it. And I wound up placing second in all of New York City in that tournament in terms of impromptu speaking about, you know, speaking about, what I want or whatever I have you. So, um, it, you know, obviously that showed me that I do wanted to do something in business, but, you know, I didn't think it would be to the capacity where it's at now. So you had the gift of gab. What did you, what did you see for yourself? What, or I should say it like this, what was your idea of success? What did it look like at that age in your life? Um, I was big on uh, Eddie Murphy boomerang, <laughs> you know, um, a lot of people don't know a lot of the, the premise of a hundred suits, the suit aspect was, you know, based off of what my father and my uncle Chuck, who are both my guardians right now, um, used to always dress up, you know, and always talking about the importance of getting dressed up. My father, when, um, when Easter came around, he always bought us brand new bright ass suits. Um, and you know, you, you look good, but, when I was 15 years old, I never forget buying this red blazer. Um, it was based off the movie Boomerang with Eddie Murphy. So it's 1992. Don't forget it. And um, we, I was able to buy this blazer, and um, it matched the socks, and it was a mock turtleneck. No, no, it was a tie that goes with it. And um, I, I went and I used to walk around 34th Street and just ask for jobs. At 15 years old, I never forget that, you know, I because mm. I, I remember how I felt in the suit that, you know, um, that's a story that I never forget, you know, getting on a train and riding around, walking around Manhattan. And I thought I was, you know, somebody. And then I met this guy, there's a Jewish guy named Julius Gross. Um, he had an office in um, Pennsylvania Plaza on 34th Street. Hold on a second, honey. He had an office in Pennsylvania Plaza, and I, I was able to create a friendship with him. You know, he, um, you know, he was an older Jewish gentleman, and, you know, he, he was just nice. You know, he, he seen me walk around. He said, I look nice. And, you know, he just sit down and we'll, we'll build a relationship and things of that nature. Um, you know, so that, that, was, that, was, that was something that um, I did when I was 15. What did you learn from uh, Mr. Gross? It's not so much I learned from no, it's not so much I learned something from him. It was just he opened up to me. Like he opened, 
his doors. He allowed me to see his office. And, you mm -hmm. know, I felt like I had a friend in Manhattan. And then I went ahead and got um, some of you. And then I started working at a partnership for the homeless. That was my very first job outside of my father. Um, I was I was working with them in summer internship in Manhattan on 27th Street. I never forget it. I used to think I had my own office that I had a desk. There. I never forget <laughs> that partnership for the homeless. Shout out to them. Did you ever have any relatives that spent time in prison or or in gangs? No. no. Okay. Did you live around? Because I want to kind of cut to. 2011 now 2010 2011 you're working at carver bank yeah um, no it wasn't based it, where I'm, where the office was located and and I, you know i'm surprised to give a carver that much credence um the bank i used to work at <laughs> um <laughs> they, they doubted me in the beginning i'll tell you that right now i got written up and everything else um but um the area is it was high uh gang involvement a lot of issues over there with young just young people in general you know i remember you know, having to usher a, you know, a lady away from a, a razor blade fight right around the corner from where I was working at. Never forget it. Um, but um, I, I always wanted to do something. But let me just pause right there to 2011. I started doing community work in a community back in 2007. Okay. So New York, New York State's current attorney general, Letitia James, was a council member at the time. And it was a young man that was shot in the head and killed in Brooklyn. I remember going to her office to advocate with the mother about getting justice. I remember that very clearly. That was my very first piece of ag advocacy. But then I started doing Christmas drives every year up until 2011. So, Wait, so, so can you hold on a second. You, you read the article about the guy getting shot and then just on your own, you went to the guy's mother's place? Yeah. And I reached out and asked her if I could help. And I remember sitting at Letish James, who's now the attorney general office back in 2007, and, you know, trying to advocate, uh, uh, advocate for his uh, justice. Um, it was aired on 98.7 KISS FM at the time in New York City, which was an urban radio station. That was an ESPN. But um, that was my very first piece of advocacy. Um, but, you know, but, but but that that yeah yeah that was as I think about it, that was my very first piece of advocacy. What inspired you to do that as a first time? I mean, it, I mean, it was just tragic, you know. Um, I think that with you know seeing a young person, I think he was like maybe ten years old, uh, getting shot and killed, you know, and it, it was tragic. So I just wanted to say something, do what I can or whatever I can. Again, that's my mother's side that came out, and mm -hmm. um, you know. So I'm a very first piece. What, and what, what was the takeaway from that? Did you come away from that experience thinking, wow, I can really make a difference if I just no, put myself out there? All. No, not at all. It wasn't even about me. I just got pissed off about what happened. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, so it wasn't even about me, oh, you know. Getting, but what, did you think it was easy? It was it easier than you thought it would be to make a difference? Or was it? No, I didn't even think about it like that. that realized? I didn't even think about it like that, to be honest with you. I just saw, like, that's 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 just the self-starter in me. Like, I saw something and I went to work, you know, with what I had, you know, and I didn't have much. I didn't have nothing, actually. But I saw something and I went ahead and did what I needed to do um, or whatever I thought I could do. Um, so that's what happened with that. But every year I would host toy drives and give the toys to kids in women's shelters. Um, and I still got photos on my Facebook of these of these events. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did my very first suit drive at the Sean Bell Community Center. Sean Bell was the man that was shot. He got killed, killed by the in the police. wedding. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I always worked with his father, William Bell. And so our very first suit drive was held at the Sean Bell Community Center, which I still have the photo, uh, where mm -hmm. we received our very first donation of suits. No, not the very first. This we that was one of our drive locations. The very first was inside a Carver Bank when I asked my manager if I could put a box in the lobby and ask people to donate suits. So this this the way the story goes, I don't know if this is, is still accurate, but some woman was talking about guys with their pants mm -hmm. down or something and you you yeah. you, so you reacted I was to in, that. I, yeah, so I was in Popeyes around the corner from the bank and um 
you know, this lady, there's a, kid, a guy before us, she took a picture of him and then uploaded it to Facebook and began to berate him. And um, mm-hmm. little did I know, well, little did she know, we were friends on Facebook. You know, you have friends on Facebook, you don't know these people, but you're yeah. still friends on. So yeah. I saw the post. And, um, you know, I, I got kind of, I got, I got pissed off. Like, why would you do that? Like, you know, we have enough black men being torn down as is. Why would you, black and brown men being torn down? Why, why would you do that? Like, does that make you feel good? So that's when I, you know, went and I spoke to my manager, uh, Martin at the time and asked him if I can, um, put a box in the lobby and, um, and, and get people to donate their business attire so that I can go ahead and put a suit rack out in front of the area where there was a lot of issues at. If you look online, you'll still see, you'll see me with a suit rack um, on the street. That was my very first pop-up ever back in 2011. And you had already kind of done this once before at the Sean Bell Center. No, no, it wasn't a pop-up. We That was just a, a donation collection spot. Right. But I'm saying you'd already collected suits once before no. this so no. the Carver Bank was the first time you collected the suits. That was the very first suit. Uh, Justin Ragu, who was my assistant manager, was the very first mm-hmm. person to ever donate a suit to 100 suits. Once we started getting in, suits trickled in. That's when I reached out to Sean Bell Community Center and a barbershop in my area to be our donation drop-off locations. Got it. So how was it received when you put the little flyer up and put the box out in the lobby? The customers I mean, well start. Received. Yeah, yeah, it, it caught wind because um, I had at the time he was the uh, a congressman and he was running for mayor, um, mm-hmm. Anthony Weiner. I don't know if you heard of Anthony Weiner before. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah so he he came by personally and donated his suits. Um, Council member Ruben Wills, he was he actually don uh, created my logo um, in the beginning. Um, shout out to him. Um, also, um, you know. New York one started covering me. They didn't cover me until, so I had to move the suits out the lobby of the bank because I got written up because to be getting so many suits in the box, I had to start adding them into the employees where they hang their coats up and it was nothing but suits in there. So the manager at the time, (laughs) she wrote me up for that. And, um, and you know, whatever. Um, but I must say that the bank was recognizing what I was doing. You know, I got, you know, we used to have an employee um, newsletter that goes out and they spotlight it that I give out suits or collecting suits or whatever have you. Um, but I had to take the suits out. So I brought them to my my room that I was renting at the time. And that's when New York One did a story on me. Um, Cheryl Wills, who's now the anchor of New York One, um, came to my house and she saw that I had my my room draped with suits. And um, that was the only place I could store them because I didn't have enough money. How are you getting all this press? Were you leveraging the Letitia James? No, uh, not at all. PR people? Not at all. No, that was four years before. Um, I didn't know any of the, anything about that. Um, New York won caught win because um, people would bring in his suits. So somebody must have told them about me and then I got a call from Cheryl Wills. And that's how hmm. we were able to start getting press. I didn't know anything okay. about it, doing a whole press run and connecting. I didn't know anything about that. I am Kevin Livingston from South Jamaica, Queens. Didn't know anything about how to do a press <laughs> run, get my word out, none of that stuff. Okay, so you said you handed them all out on the very first day. You got the suit rack, you did your pop-up things, mm. and uh, you start giving out the kids on the corner. What was the reception like? I was good, man. You could, Like I said, you can still see some of the photos. I would take the suits. I didn't give all of them out, but I gave out quite a few. Um, and mm-hmm. then we took the suits and brought them to a gun buyback program. There's a video on my page where, um, <laughs> like, I, I, I one thing about me is I could always look back at what I did when I first started. I took documented pictures and videos. Um, I remember being pissed off because the people who were getting the suits didn't look like black men or, or Hispanic men. They were uh, middle-aged white men coming to turn in their guns that they had in their house. It wasn't the young men who needed to turn in the guns. So I remember mm-hmm. taking the suits off the rack and bringing them across the street and um, and leaving them on a um, on a on a on a um, liquor store shutter. And you can hear mm-hmm. one of the guys like, "Don't trust them." <laughs> you can hear one of the guys say, "Don't trust them." 
Well, you, you, I think you said some, some, some guys were selling their suits. They were getting a suit from you, and then yeah. they were going well, around well, the corner a, and selling I, it. I, I did catch a guy um, selling his suit at the train station after we gave it to him at our first location. Mm-hmm. What did you, what did you say to him? I say nothing to him. I mean, you got to rest. You, you have to look back in that mirror. But I knew, but I can't blame him. You know what I'm saying? I'm not Macy's. And that's what I was becoming. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If I give you a suit, the hell else can I expect you? If I ain't helping you with something else or mentoring you or helping you get a job or whatever I have, I, what, what, what can I do? Like, I, I right. can't get mad at you. I'm not helping you. So that's that was the beginning of me tra- tra- transitioning the company to do more than just give out suits. At that point, were you a one-man show? Did you have a little, a few volunteers helping you out? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. CEO, cleaner, janitor. Um, customer service rep, which I'm the horrible one at. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a horrible. I'm so, so Stacy is like I'm a horrible customer service rep. Um, but <laughs> um, you know, I, I was one man show. You know, um, and um, you know, I, it just it was that was it was just me. And what was the oh, bank balance looking like at that time? Um, so I had you know, when I was doing my suit drive this gentleman by the name of Lewis came in and he loved what I do, you know, what I was doing. And so he worked at a, uh, a charity and they mm-hmm. needed my service. So he said, Hey, I got a room where you can operate your suiting and we won't charge you for the room. Just bring your suits to service our clients. And I was like, okay, bet. So it was right across the park a lot from my bank. So I went ahead and, I was working at the bank and on my lunch break, I run across the street, suit people and they come back to work. I, I did that for about eight months before I mm-hmm. quit. What was that? Well, what happened? What caused you to quit? Did you get, cause I know well, you I turned did, I, into a 501c3 later, but it's, it yeah, was still so just a, basically a charity so service. This is, so this is what happened. Um, in 20, 2013, um, I no 2012, I, um, I was doing both. And then I was presented an opportunity to make to to do a contract in the Bronx payable five thousand dollars payable for over eight months. And mm-hmm. I was like, OK. I can stay here, make forty thousand dollars as a customer service rep. I hate this job <laughs> or I can take this leap. And at the time, my my retail manager, who I was very, very close with, who now is a superstar NBA agent, which is Dennis Robinson, who is the agent for Kawhi Leonard, Mm -hmm. right? Dennis was my boy. Like, Dennis was the reason why I was at the bank, you know, and all this other stuff. It's crazy. Like, people know my story. Um, So anyway, (laughs) Dennis was leaving as well because Kawhi, I think Kawhi got drafted and, you know, he was picking up momentum in the league. So Dennis was leaving to go to San Diego where where Kawhi is from and um and so I I I I I got tired of the bank and I said you know what I'm not coming back so I I let them fire me so I can collect unemployment so I can have me something to sustain myself while I'm doing this entrepreneurial leap and I took that five thousand dollar check and failed <laughs> you know what I mean like I, I thought I could sustain it you know what I mean but I I feel I did the program I did well you know but I thought that would hold me over you know, and, and, and it was a complete failure. I never had $5,000 in my hand at one time. Mm. And so, um, you know, that blew through my fingers real, real quick. And then, you know, I, I had to get back up and move again. What kind of car were you driving at the time? Um, it's called um, NY, uh, New York City Metropolitan Transit Authority, <laughs> the train. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <I> <laughs> well, you, you ended up, there's, you know, you ended up, being homeless for a little while and yeah, in so 2015 20, 2016 2016 june of 20 july of 2016 to about mid-august right so you'd already created 100 suits for 100 men at that point absolutely yeah and what what led to the the homeless stint the sleeping in your car well, stint well we ran out of money from the last contract we had um um shout out to fed cap who gave us the contract and they did one of the most iconic things, which I still have very close with leadership there is that they did not refund me 
because my paperwork work. Because I mean, I was doing the work. My paperwork, my paperwork wasn't right. So mm-hmm. I would not update the things that they need. And you know, with organizations, you have to update your pay. So long story short, they did not refund me. But the lady at the time, Marcia, who was one of my mentors said, you know, I respect you, but you're not, we're not going to move forward. However, I'm going to pay you one extra month. And I, you know, that was a big deal. Cause that was a, that was a, that was a game changer for me. Um, mm-hmm. cause I did not have anything, but in July, uh, you know, certain circumstances happened to family and I had no place to go. I didn't tell people I had places to go, but I did, you know, I'm, I'm a prideful person. So I, I stayed mm-hmm. in my car for a month and a half. I drove taxi in 2016. People don't believe that. While, while, while still doing a hundred suit service, I didn't have an office at the time, but I drove taxi in 2016. And you had been at it for five years at that point. So mm-hmm. was a plan to kind of turn that into something that could potentially support you financially as a, as a, as a nonprofit? No, no. Cause uh, you know, I didn't believe that I was going to have a business the size that I have now, because again, mm-hmm. you know, people, I, I'm not, I'm not the type of person to be, you know, uh, a clout chaser or hot of the moment, you know, uh, let me get involved because it, it's it's cute now or let me get a slate, a saying on my t-shirt because it's cute and all this other bullshit. I felt like um, um, right now um, I, I needed to do something in my community and be, and be, and be, and be, be a, a, a thorn on the sides of, of the politicians who sit there and ain't doing shit. And so, I was one of those types that be in their face and letting them know, you know, you need to do more. This is what's happening. Why are we talking about a street bump when the kid was killed on the corner? I was one of those types. Um, And so, um, you know, I garnered a lot of uh, haters. (laughs) I remember the first time I was at a meeting, I mentioned what I was doing with 100 suits and two people snickered at me. I never forget it. I never, ever forget it. Um, As a matter of fact, the very first person that I took the, when I first started, when I was getting ready to start a hundred suits, it was a company called the Jamaica bid. And, um, I told her about what I wanted to do and if she could help me. She said, Oh, I can help you get suits from the stores, whatever have you. And she said, I'm gonna call you back. And I waited two weeks and she never called me back. And I called her and I said, Hey, I was just following up. And she says, yeah, I'm not interested. I hung the phone up on me. It's just so ironic that I'm talking about that right now because the leader of Jamaica performance, I mean, Jamaica bid, email me today. That's the one, mm. if you, <laughs> Stacey, if I told you to schedule a meeting with her, mm-hmm. they're the ones who turned me down when I first, they're the ones who didn't believe that same company. It was just funny how God worked. Now they want to excite, <laughs> they want to meet me and everything else. <laughs> I'm telling you, people don't well, know my story. Well, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so, so at uh, that time, were you trying to get your friends to help you or, or um, h- how did they see what you were doing? Your closest friends or even your family, what did they think about what you were doing? Um, I mean, everybody loved what I was doing, you know, but my mother, she was working. My father was in Florida. You know, um, I didn't really ask people because, again, I was a one man show. You know, mm. I would ask people to pull up, you know, whatever have you. But I literally was a one man show for a very long time. And you were you. Were you, did you ever think about giving up at any point during those five years hell no. when you were? I don't know. What, hell no. What's that? <laughs> well, how do you get that? Where do you, where does that come from? That sense of even, determination. I didn't determine. I don't know what those words mean, bro. Like <laughs> that's that's those those are those make my skin itch. Um, I just go, bro. <laughs> like I just go. I don't give up. Mm-mm. No sir. So when you when you had to go sleep in that car park in the, in the cell phone parking lot at JFK. Um, that was just, you just felt like, okay, I got to, this is what I got to do to keep, keep everything going. Like it was all about keeping everything going. Well, you know, I, I had no place to go, you know, and I wasn't mm-hmm. telling people what I was going through, you know? And when I told my sister, you know, she was pissed with me. She was very pissed with me. Um, Cause she was mad that I didn't say anything, you know, as, mm-hmm. as well as my father. But, you know, I'm the type of person that would tighten my belt before I ask for help. Um, but, you know, I still kept going. You know, there's a picture of me in 2016 leading a march of 500 people in Jamaica because mm. of two unsolved murders 
by people in our community. Everybody jumps in the marches when police do it, but we very rarely march when we do it to ourselves. And so led that march, but a lot of people don't know that night, I had no place to go home to. I slept in JFK Park all that night. Never forget it. So when I look at that picture, it just shows me how far I came. Um, but then I had a buddy in August who told me he had a room in his basement. And, um, you know, I took the room. And, 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 but it was still a rough road um, from that point. Um, what are you watching? I'm not watching anything. Okay. Uh, rough road from that point. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I didn't even have enough to buy my daughter anything for Christmas. You know what I mean? Like, I bought her one of those rolling paper, uh, pen things, you know, um, mm -hmm. that year. You know, it was a rough year. 2016 was rough. But, um, you know, proceed, still pursue, still did what I did with 100 suits. I didn't have an office at the time. No, I'm lying. I had an office. That was the one that was in Manhattan. But that contract ended, did not have a place to bring my suits. In the midst of me driving taxi, not being, not under no official contract, I was able to secure a space inside of New York State Parole. And that's mm -hmm. when I opened up the office inside of parole in, um, in December. And, um, and we, we had a boutique inside of, of parole where we were giving suits to guys coming out of jail. Um, one of the young men to this day, um, who I met back in 2016 when he just came home, uh, for reference, Stacy, uh, Mr. Ortiz um, uh, is still working with us to this day. To this day, mm -hmm. and this is back in 2016 when I met him in parole. Um, and so um, we did that. You know, I did a suit drive in parole um, and everything else. But um, in February, um, I had got a phone call. Brooklyn's district attorney, Kenneth P. Thompson, passed away. Um, legendary first African American attorney in Brooklyn. His wife wanted to give away his suits. So she called me the night before and I explained to her, I appreciate, I told her what I was going through. I don't know why. And I usually don't open up to people. And I remember telling her what I was going through. And she brought me to downtown Brooklyn. She says, I want to give you these suits. We did a press conference with the new district attorney. And she, you know, I was in this big conference room overlooking Manhattan. And she handed me an envelope, and the first envelope had five thousand dollar check in it. And I started mm -hmm. bawling out crying. And then she said, "Here's another one." Then she gave me another envelope, and it had twenty five thousand dollar check. And wow. I, I mean, I was a, I was a complete mess. And to this day, Lashawn Thompson is the chair of my board of directors. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a very so inspiring story. We 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 caught wind, you know. Um, from 2017 to now, you know, we were able to open up a chapter of 100 suits in Williston, South Carolina, which is celebrating their second year of operation. We've opened up, we've, we secure contracts with the Department of Corrections, um, New York City Crisis Management System, um, Department of Education. We've created well over 50 plus jobs in New York City um, through these contracts. We started a, a food insecurity business where we were helping senior citizens a week before COVID. I had pivoted and started getting groceries for seniors. And to date, we've made over 130,000 home deliveries to senior citizens in Southeast Queens. Um, you know, we created full-time jobs through the Cure Violence contract uh, for men who men and women who were formerly justice involved. Um, and, and we keep going. Can you just describe the process? Like I'm, I'm, I, a person has recently been paroled. You have your suit pop up in the actual DA's office, right? So or we have a local, no, so we have, so when they're paroled or released from incarceration, we have, God bless you, honey. We have reentry mentors who work with them. So they are contacted. We bring them in, we do an assessment and then we plug them away with services. So I have, in Jamaica, my office is in Jamaica, I have four re-entry mentors who work with men and women 25 and older who have been incarcerated. Then I have three re-entry mentors who work with young men 14 to 24 who have had criminal justice involvement. That's outside of what I do with the cure of violence piece. So, you know, we, we, we have a lot of hands in the, in, um, in the 
justice involvement system. How does it work? How do, do they get a suit? They get a stylist? They get... Um... So suiting is just a carrot. Like literally yeah. that's, you know, I always say that. So we, we work is that they meet with the reentry mentor. We find uh-huh. out what it needs. Um, do they have um, job needs? Do they have families? Uh, uh, right now is that we're working on a, a, a very first um, male baby shower. So this is going to be for men who have had justice involvement, who have children on the way. We're going to have a baby shower for them so that they can feel the love and support that they deserve. And they'll be able to take care of their families. Beautiful. So how did you get on the radar of Steve Harvey and Colin Kaepernick and these kind of guys? There are a lot of men are being beaten up, and I feel it's our responsibility to do what we can to pour into them to build them back up. Mm-hmm. Well, you've also received support from some pretty big, big names out there. Well, how, how did that uh-huh. all come about? Um, Steve Harvey, they emailed me. Um, Colin Kaepernick, um, they reached out to me. You know, that's my brother right there. Um, mm-hmm. Colin's my brother. Been been rocking with Colin going on five years now. Um, uh, Akil Salam, which is another director. Um, he's so random. He's a, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's a black Hollywood director. Um, Mm -hmm. he noticed what I was doing and just randomly somebody called me and said, Hey, is your, is your address at X, Y, and Z? I said, yes. And they just said, okay, thank you. And I went back to my office three days later. It was a check for $10,000 there. Wow. Uh, you know, and me and him has constantly stayed in contact. Um, Jill Scott, reach, uh, you know, shared our stuff. Um, Zane, <laughs> the author Zane shared our stuff, you know. Um, but one of the pinnacle moments of my life happened this um, this past February 3rd on my birthday when um, I was asked to meet with the president of the United States. So I was oh. able to meet with um, Joe Biden um and talk about you know the work and what we do in gun violence prevention so you know from being um a high school dropout ninth grade um you know kicked out you know chastised laughed at when you started your business to being invited by the white house to meet with the president of the united states that that right there is something that i and i wore my father's pen my father's favorite pen he always wore mm. his hat added on my suit jacket mm. What would you say if someone's listening to this and they you're thinking, well, man, I've always wanted to help the community in some way. What 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 words of wisdom would you impart on that young person? Three words: move your ass. Start now. <laughs> That's a fact. Start now. Like it ain't no uh, Buddha, Zen, none of that. Brother, just get on it. You know what I mean? Start now. You know, emotion creates emotion. You know, motion in other way around, vice versa. And final question, uh, Kevin, how are you thinking about success these days? Uh, when I see somebody that we're helping um, turn around and help somebody else. Mm. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.